Hello everybody and welcome to Hot Topics, where today we are going to continue our series, which we began last time. We're going to continue our series that is entitled, Words Truly Matter. If you were with us last time, I explained to you that there are a lot of theological words that you hear preached from the pulpits. Words like atonement, election, salvation. Uh, words like righteousness. Now, these are theological words. They are biblical. But... the way the words are used, the way they're taught, the way they're understood. Oh, you can have a massive difference in those words. As we saw last time, I taught you about really two words during the time of the Reformation. Two words that seem rather insignificant, but in the context of the Reformation, they were massive words. The Reformers taught, and here's the word, alone. The Reformers taught that the Bible alone is our authority. And that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, all to the glory of God alone alone. These alones are called the five solas of the Reformation. And the Reformers taught the solas because they were showing how the Roman Catholic Church was absolutely in error, and still is, when it comes to what they teach about how a person can be saved. Again, the reformers taught the solas. Scripture alone, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, all to the glory of God alone. Rome taught and still teaches that the Bible is the word of God, but not the Bible alone. They say the Bible and church tradition, that which the Pope declares, that which the, the magisterium declares. They said the Bible is God's word, but the Bible and church tradition is our authority. Do you see the difference? Two words, alone versus and. Rome also taught that you're saved by grace and merit, faith and your works, Christ and the sacramental system, and therefore, certainly God alone doesn't get the glory. God and, I don't know, the church or whatever. You see the difference how words truly matter. Again, two seemingly insignificant words, alone versus and. Yet, put into the context of the Reformation, massive differences, right? Words truly matter. Well, today we're going to continue our series, and we're going to talk about righteousness. Again, the word righteousness, and I, <laughs> I used to be able to say in most churches the word righteousness is declared. I'm not sure about that today, but let me say it this way. Uh, I would say people who go to church, Protestant churches, probably, and even Catholic church, probably are familiar with the word righteous or righteousness. And that's because, you know, the big question is, how can sinful man be righteous in the eyes of holy God? Great question. The Bible tells us. But words truly matter. For instance, 
The reformers taught that a person is righteousness is imputed or credited to your account. It's not your righteousness. It's someone else's righteousness. Who is that someone else? The Lord Jesus Christ. His perfect righteous life, his perfect once for all uh, uh, substitutionary atonement, his perfect righteousness is credited or imputed to the account of the elect, those who are chosen by God. It's not your righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. It is, here's the theological word, imputed to your account. Rome taught and still teaches today. Uh, no, no, no. They, built, they also are trying to figure out how a sinful man can be righteous in God, holy God's eyes. So they say, yeah, you need to be righteous. But how? They teach infused righteousness or inherent righteousness. What they teach is that when a child is baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, they teach that not only is that uh, child's original sin erased, which is not biblical, but they also teach that God infuses some righteousness to that child. And therefore, that child, they teach, is in a state of grace or a state of justification. They're not saying that that child is guaranteed to be saved, but they're saying that the process has started. That God has infused some righteousness into that person. And therefore, they say that person now possesses inherent righteousness. But that person needs to keep that righteousness going and growing so that they teach that person one day may be declared righteous in God's eyes. Do you see it? Imputed righteousness, the righteousness of Christ credited to your account, God declares. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of Christ's righteousness credited to you. Rome taught and teaches, well, no, God infuses some righteousness. You now inherit, you, in, you, you, you have inherent righteousness, but that doesn't mean you're yet saved. You've got to now get, keep it going. And they say that you work with the church, going through the sacramental system constantly, constantly, with the hope that maybe one day, they say, you'll be righteous in God's eyes. Well, what happens if you're not righteous based upon their system? Well, they say, it's no problem. You die, you maybe have to go to a fictitious place called purgatory, where you will be purged, purged, purged of sins. You've got your living loved ones who are pay praying for you and paying to get you out of purgatory. And then the Catholic Church says, on that day, probably once you're popped out of purgatory, you'll be righteous in God's eyes. By the way, that's nowhere in the Bible. And so, the Reformers taught about righteousness. Rome taught about righteousness. But, words truly matter, right? Imputed righteousness versus infused or inherent righteousness. Most people are not discerning enough to see the massive difference. They say, well, both groups talk about righteousness. It's a biblical term. It's a theological term. It's okay. They both agree. No, no, no. Massive, massive difference, right? And so, the question naturally would be this. Well, how do we know that, let's say, the Reformers and many people to... Uh, see people today who, who preach the Bible, um, 
how do we know that they're correct when they teach imputed righteousness? Or is it Rome that's correct? They teach infused or inherent righteousness. Well, the answer is simple. Let's check and see what the scripture says. Let's see some examples of how sinful people were declared righteous in the sight of holy God. Let's start in the Old Testament. Let's go to Abraham, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We are told that God promised Abraham that Abraham would be blessed by God with descendants and land. And that through the line of Abraham, the earth would be blessed. Why? Because the Messiah was going to come through the line of Abraham. Well, we are told in Genesis 15, verse 6, how Abraham was saved, how he was declared righteous in God's eyes. Verse 6, Abraham what? Believed in the Lord. Believed in the promise of the coming Messiah and what he would do through his once-for-all sacrificial death and resurrection, right? Abraham looked forward to the coming of Christ. He believed faith. And what was the result? God reckoned, credited, or imputed to Abraham as righteousness. Whose righteousness? Was it Abraham's righteousness based upon his good efforts and good works? Absolutely not. Abraham believed God's promise of the coming Messiah. That the Messiah would come, that the Messiah would pay for the sins of Abraham. Abraham believed by faith and the righteousness of Christ was imputed or credited to Abraham's account. In fact, you see this same idea. Go to Isaiah chapter 61. This idea of imputed righteousness. Yes, even in the Old Testament. Verse 10. Look at the words of a repentant sinner. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Whose righteousness? The perfect righteousness of the Messiah. In fact, go to Romans chapter 4. Paul ties in this idea in Romans 4 of how a sinful person can be righteous in the eyes of holy God. And watch the example Paul uses. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? How is it that Abraham was righteous in God's eyes? Paul says in verse 2. Well, if Abraham was justified by his works... If, you know, Abraham, if God had infused some righteousness to Abraham, and then it was up to Abraham to really keep this going, to make himself righteous before God, he says, if Abraham was justified by works, well, then guess what? Abraham had a lot to boast about. Ta-da, God, look what you and I did for me to be righteous. But Paul says, no, end of verse two, no boasting before God. <laughs> 
okay, Paul, then how is it that Abraham was declared righteous? Verse 3, he says, what's the scripture say? And you know what scripture he refers to? He goes back to the scripture we saw earlier, Genesis 15, 6. He says, Abraham believed. He believed God. And it was credited, imputed to him as righteousness. Do you see it? Again, he goes down to verse 7. He goes, let's use the example of King David. How was he? A sinful man. Righteous in God's eyes. Verses 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. How was David saved? Same way as Abraham. By grace alone, through faith alone, in the coming of Christ and who he was and what he would do alone. It was Christ's righteousness imputed to Abraham's and David's account. Because again, you can just read on your own about Abraham's life. Whoa, father of faith, boy, his faith faltered all over the place. He was a sinner, just like you and me. Same with King David. Let's see. He committed adultery. He tried to cover it up with murder. Uh, David, through his own good works, could make himself righteous before holy God? Not a chance. It was the righteousness of Christ, the Messiah to come. It was his perfect righteousness credited, imputed to Abraham and David's account. In fact, just hop over, stay in this chapter. Verse 23, Paul says it was not just for his sake or Abraham's sake that it was written, that it was credited to him but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He, Christ, was delivered over. Why? Because of our transgressions. And he was raised. Why? Because of our justification. Do you see it? Again, the Bible teaches that sinful man can only be righteous in the eyes of holy God. How? Perfect righteousness has to be seen by God in that person. Well, do any of us think that we can perfectly obey God's laws? Nope. Do any of us think that through all of our good efforts, even religious efforts, going through all kinds of sacraments and all that, do any of us actually think that we can make ourselves perfect and righteous in the eyes of God? No. It is not our righteousness. It is somebody else's. As Martin Luther said, it's extra nos. It is outside of us. It's someone else's righteousness. Who's that someone else? The Lord Jesus Christ. His perfect life, his perfect sacrifice, his perfect righteousness is imputed or credited to your account. So that, go to Romans 8, God the Father can declare about a person now. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see it? Rome teaches that at baptism, an infant has some righteousness infused into him or her. And then it's up to that person with the help of the Roman sacrificial system. It's up to that person to keep that righteousness going and growing. Because Rome teaches that it's your righteousness that God is has under analysis. And that's why so many Catholics are terrified if they miss, you know, 
uh, church service, if they miss, you know, the big deal, the, the, the Eucharist and all that stuff, that they, they don't go to the priest and confess enough. And, you know, all the, even when a Catholic dies, what does the priest do? He gives what are called last rites, part of the sacramental system. They're just trying to do everything they can to be declared righteous under God's analysis. So let me ask you a question. I mean, how was Abraham saved? God looked at Abraham's life, and under analysis, God said, well, Abraham, great job. I'm going to declare you righteous now. No. How about King David? How about any human? Again, it's not our righteousness. It's not our inherent righteousness that God finally goes, great, you finally made it, come on in. Not a chance. It's the perfect righteousness of Christ. It has to be credited to your account. It has to be imputed to your account. Hop over to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Again, what a wonderful, wonderful picture here, this verse, on the doctrine of imputation. He, the Father, made him the Son, who knew no sin, here it is, to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we, the sinners, might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you see it? There's your doctrine of imputation right there. Clearly, right? Our sins are placed on Christ. He's the perfect one, the sinless one. And God treats him as though he had sinned. He never sinned. He did not become a sinner when our sins were placed on him. That's heresy. Rather, our sins were credited to Christ. Not, again, let me emphasize, not that Christ was a sinner, but our sins were imputed to him. Therefore, God treated him, two key words, as though he had sinned. And therefore, God's wrath was poured out on him instead of on us. Jesus declared, paid in full, he died. But three days later, he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for us. The result? The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And God treats us, two key words, as though we lived the perfect life of Christ and that we never sinned. Do you see it? Let me re read this verse again. He, the Father, made him the Son who knew no sin be sin in our behalf. Our sins are imputed to Christ. God treats him as though he sinned and God poured out his wrath on him. So that we, the sinners, might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to us. God treats us as though we didn't sin. God treats us as though we lived a perfect life because he sees the righteousness of Christ credits us, and that's why God declares in Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not because God's looking at my righteousness and making that declaration, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. Does that make sense? Go over to Philippians chapter 3. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. We saw Abraham, right? Uh, David. Uh, we saw a repentant sinner in Isaiah. Doctrine of imputation. Paul declares it as Christians, we're, we're, we're declared righteous the same way. Imputation. We saw in 2 Corinthians 5 how that all looks. Let's take a look at the Apostle Paul, a man who definitely was trying to make himself righteous in God's eyes as a hypocritical Pharisee until God in his grace saved him. Watch what Paul says. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 5. Paul's going to give a kind of like a, um, a resume of all his goodness that he thought at one time was good enough to eventually make him righteous in God's eyes. 
He says, verse 5, he goes, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, I'm following God's law. Um, I'm of the nation of Israel. Oh, I come directly from the line of Abraham. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm always a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. I was definitely, in my own eyes, making myself right before God. I was following the system perfectly. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. I even thought by persecuting Christ's church, I was pleasing God and making myself righteous. As to righteousness, according to the law, he says, I, I thought myself blameless. Verse 7. But. Whatever things were gained to me, all that stuff that I thought I was gaining, all of that righteousness that I thought I was accruing that was inherent in me, he goes, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all those things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. All that stuff that Paul had on his resume that he wanted to present before God and say, Ta-da! Can you declare me righteous? Paul says all that stuff, I count them as rubbish. that I may gain Christ, and here it is, verse 9, and that I may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Boom. There it is. The reformers were reading passages like this and saying, wait a second, we've been teaching what Rome taught us. Um, that, you know, you've got to keep that supposed inherent righteousness that God infused into you. You've got to keep that going, just like Paul was trying to do when he was a Pharisee. And all of a sudden, the reformers started reading the scripture and reading in the original languages, as I said at the beginning, and they're going, wait a second. What did Paul say here? Paul says, all that stuff that I was trying to do as a, as a zealous Pharisee, as a Hebrew of Hebrews, all that stuff, even from my very birth when I was circumcised on the eighth day, Paul says, all that stuff? Rubbish. In comparison to the perfect righteousness of of Christ that comes from God that was imputed to Paul's account. Do you see it? That's what the reformers were reading. And they said, wait a second. What Rome's teaching, infused righteousness, inherent right? No. And so words truly matter, don't they? Again, as we saw last week, the Reformers and Rome talked about the Bible, talked about grace and faith and Christ and God's glory. But there were different words that were used. The Reformers, the Bible alone. Rome, the Bible and the Pope in the magisterium, the church tradition. The reformers, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Rome, you're saved by grace and merit. Faith and your works. Christ and the sacrificial system and to God and the church be the glory. Two words. And today, what did we learn? Reformers taught righteousness. Rome taught and teaches righteousness. But what kind of righteousness? Whose righteousness? The Bible teaches clearly that it is only the imputed righteousness of Christ that can make a guilty sinner right in the eyes of holy God.
Think of how Abraham was saved. Think about how David was saved. Think about how Paul was saved. Think about how we are saved. It is the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to us. And when God declares there's now no condemnation in Andrew, it's not because God looks at some supposed inherent in righteousness in Andrew and under God's analysis, God goes, great job, Andrew. I can make that declaration about you. No. What does God see? He sees the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to me. That's why he can make that declaration. Rome, however, taught and still teaches. God kind of starts the process, giving you some righteousness and infusing some to you. But you and the church have to keep it going and growing. Where do you stand on righteousness? How do you think you, as a guilty sinner, can be righteous in the eyes of holy God? How do you think you can be accepted by God? Based on your inherent righteousness, as Rome teaches? Or based only on the imputed righteousness of Christ. Words truly matter, don't they? We'll talk about some more words next time.